Thank you, Dr. Glave, and good morning, everyone. Um, Scott, firstly, take the opportunity to thank you, everyone, for the welcome and support in moving over to a new place and found it a very friendly place to get established and uh, up and running um, and enjoying our time here. So my talk uh, on the role of surgical uro-oncology in the geriatric population um, was prompted by a reflection around a recent patient, um, but also observations I've made from my recent training outside New Zealand, uh, both in Australia and here now, um, in compared to the experience I'd gained as a, a resident or registrar training at home. Um, yeah, certainly part of fellowship is to be educated and challenged on what your practices you've seen and done um, previously. And, um, I think this exemplifies it. So the, the one particular case that really got me thinking was a recent 86-year-old gentleman um, uh, who I saw in the clinic who had been diagnosed with a three-centimetre left distal ureteric mass. So like the urothelial carcinoma, by size, was had some risk factors uh, for its, and certainly definitive surgery would be nephro-u or distal urethrectomy. This stuck in my mind because his daughter was there and very proactive and, and certainly argued his case that he was a fit and well gentleman living independently. And when I discussed the options, but also at 86, discussed the option of no surgical intervention and rather off the cuff said that where I came from, it would be unusual to operate on an 86-year-old, um, led to quite an animated response from his daughter and you know, some navigating that conversation. And, and Dr. Glee challenged me on this New Zealand statement and approach and outlined that residents of British Columbia have one of the longest life expectancies in North America and certainly the world outside of Japan. And statement that taken, you know, you really got to look at the patient in front of you and not just your age. And I think this is my practice at home and the experience I've had is wanted to sort of think, have I have is our system been too pessimistic on people in their older age? And what when I head home, what sort of approach am I going to take? And where does the, perhaps the data support that? So what does this talk about? I think the important thing is, and I know there was a talk at some point in the last year or two on frailty. This is not a talk on frailty. So while age is a big risk and probably the biggest risk factor for frailty, uh, I wanted to explore the significance of uh, what is the significance of higher chronological age when you uncouple it from comorbidity. And so rather than frailty thinking, can this patient get through this operation, this is more a conversation for can this chronological a currently fit but chronologically old patient in front of me with a malignancy or possible diagnosis of malignancy? What is the best decision around this diagnosis and treatment for them in their own life journey at their chronological age? So some objectives that were circulated in the email was to look at sort of some data on what is the life expectancy of people in our society today, the evidence base we may have or have not for treating these cohort of patients and to look at some tools that are available and guidelines on this topic. I think um, sort of what I'd also like to, this, this talk is a hopefully uh, conversation generating and challenges people to reflect uh, both for themselves, their patients and their family about what does age mean to them. And we all, and I'll talk later about it, bring our own biases to these conversations. Um, and I thought these are some questions, particularly at the end, you know, what do you think your typical patient may live to, people in your family, and what age do you personally want to live to? I know my story, I had grandfathers who died when I was young and didn't really know them, and then I had two grandmothers who lived to an old age of 99, 94. They had very minimal in the way of medical diagnoses up until their death, but I witnessed their independence and quality of life diminish significantly from their late 80s. And so in terms of my answer to the last question, I suppose I'm framed by that experience to say, look, I'd be very happy to live a full life to 85 and then not come home one day from fishing. Um, so, yeah, some sort of age may just be a number, um, but and often people as they old age will throw this statement out, but it clearly carries a significant relevance to, all, to us in medicine because otherwise we wouldn't introduce every conversation about a patient with a statement. This is so-and-so, 76, 52, 24, et cetera. So I looked at some of the data on what is in our society here, um, the life expectancy, and a lot of this data is well known um, that we are living longer. So since the 1980s, if you were born in Canada at the 1980s, you had a life expectancy in the early 70s. By 2019, the average Canadian born in 2019 would have a 
a life expectancy of 82 years of age. This is forecast to reach 90 by the end of this century. But however, for those who survive the challenges of infancy, childhood, teenage parties, and a hard working career, your expected length of life is even longer. So this is WHO data that I've graphed across different comparable countries, uh, Canada, and, Canada in blue, um, and Australasia and UK and US, uh, some of the other lines there, showing if you've reached 60, what is your expected life, um, life or years of life ahead of you? Um, and this is steadily increasing over a similar uh, since the 2000s um, in this data. And in Canada, in 2019, if you were 60, you on average were expected to live through to 86. But what's length of life without quality of life? And the WHO had actuarial data as well for Canada over the last 20 years of a metric that I it was hard to get a dig on exactly how they meant by it, but the expected length of a healthy life. We see that is increasing and still sees patients at the age of 60 in Canada in 2019 expected to live to close to 80 of, with a healthy life. Um, the, through data within the, uh, from within Canada, I uh, found probably more interesting was, well, what about those patients who have self-selected themselves as of reasonable health by still being alive at 80 or older and was able to get this data that for someone, a male or female in Canada at the age of 80 would have on average nine years of life expectancy ahead of you. And interestingly for me, it was at 90, a 90-year-old patient in, you, in front of you would have a life expectancy still of another four years. Obviously, there's a, a range that there's fit and not so fit 85 or 90-year-olds in front of you, but the columns to the right of that were the 95% confidence intervals, which for all were relatively tight. So if that's some of the actuarial data, how good are we as both clinicians and patients at predicting life expectancy? And I think the answer from the data I looked at is that we're generally pretty inaccurate and variable in our accuracy. Uh, this paper was a survey of doctors, medical students uh, and nurses uh, with hypothetical situation, a patient situations and you need to predict their length of life or life expectancy compared to uh, validated actuarial data. Um, and what it showed was that doctors and nurses and medical students are both inaccurate and imprecise in their life expectancy uh, estimation. We tend to uh, underestimate, or in this group, tended to underestimate. Uh, and we were actually within 25% of the life expectancy in less than 45% of cases. This ran counter to some papers I'll show subsequently that where doctors tended to overestimate uh, it. But I think an important point I wanted to take out of this paper and the subsequent paper that we present here was that there was, uh, within each observer in these different clinical situations, we were relatively consistent in the error that we had compared to the, the model. But there was great variation between clinicians or between medical students within those groups. So different doctors would be quite different in their inaccuracy, and that seemed to be consistent. And there was also not huge difference between doctors and medical students or nurses, which suggests that it's not just our training, our clinical experience that makes us more or less accurate. Our inaccuracy is influenced significantly by factors outside, which might be our own life experience and story, like what I touched on with my own family, our story earlier. Uh, these papers here are plucked out of the literature. One is a, a Canadian urological and radiation oncology paper in the setting of prostate cancer. How good are we at picking life expectancy? Not particularly good in terms of getting the exact years, but this paper showed that clinicians were about 80% of the time correct at saying this patient had more or less than 10 years of life ahead of them. Uh, the second paper there showed actually that uh, with their statistical modelling that uh, clinicians were not too much better than the coin toss to being accurate on the life expectancy. What about patients? There's multiple uh, papers I was able to pull out of the literature really showed that patients are particularly uh, guilty of overestimating their own life expectancy. Um, looking at patients with uh, chronic medical conditions, uh, maybe overestimating by 40%. And in the paper that looked at patients with heart failure and COPD, approximately three times more likely to die in the next year than they actually predicted. 
So moving into our sector of urological malignancy and role or not for surgical intervention, what data do we have to treat uh, these patients or not? And here, it's a big topic. I've not attempted to define the definitive evidence base of how you should treat your older patients. Um, but instead, I've wanted to look at some of the major literature out there that we use across various malignancies to treat our patient populations in general and explore the utility or not of this data in our older patients. So dive first into the thorny topic of prostate cancer. Um, so the... The discussion of PSA trials is a, a, is a talk in its own right. Here, yeah, just the, the, one of the major trials used in support of PSA screening and to demonstrate or to reduce the risk of prostate cancer mortality. And we use this on a day-to-day -day basis in an oncology clinic to discuss with men about PSA testing. This trial, 180,000 men between the ages of 50 and 74 but it had a predefined core age group that was only 55 to 69. It did show a survival advantage of uh, prostate cancer specific mortality. The important thing for thinking of this older patient population that I've framed for this talk is that they weren't captured in this trial. And so it does not provide data to support or disprove necessarily that prostate cancer mortality or specific mortality benefit in patients over a chronological age of 75. Uh, the SPCG4 trial is a landmark trial uh, demonstrating survival benefit for the early treatment of prostate cancer. This was in the pre-PSA era. Again, this was a trial of uh, nearly 700 men under 75. But importantly, they were framed with uh, having a 10-year life expectancy. A lot of that data we've then sometimes used to extrapolate to our older patient group this magic number of a 10-year life expectancy. It did show a reduction in death from any cause, prostate cancer, death, and distant metastases. This benefit was highest in the age group under 65 years of age. Um, but there was a, a within the older age group, over 65, radical prostatectomy was associated with reduced risk of metastases amongst older men. So... Important fact, this was a, a pre-PSA screening era trial for men with localised disease in the current era of uh, PSA uh, use. And in your older man, there's a, it's a lead time bias that may negate any, some of these advantages seen for the older men. Um, and, but we did see that there were some advantages, particularly around distant metastases in older men. Important to take out that this is a cohort finding for the age group that are older, that there's not evidence for advantage in groups of older men. But there may still be an advantage for an appropriate older man uh, who of that over 65 age group. So this is a trial looking at uh, radical prostatectomy in the early in the PSA era, the pivot trial, uh, and not trying to rehash too much into the detail of these trials and uh, residents and will be familiar with them. But I think an important thing was that this was again didn't capture the older patients that we may deal with who have an elevated PSA or an early diagnosis of prostate cancer, um, having an inclusion criteria of 75 years or younger. Uh, importantly, you know, relevant to that uh, topic of predicting life expectancy, an inclusion criteria was the patients who were supposed to have a life expectancy of more than 10 years. And one of the criticisms of this trial, which didn't show um, overall a survival benefit for prostate cancer treatment, was that they selected their patients very poorly because over half of them had died within 10 years. These are patients that, you know, clinicians in theory thought at the outset had more than 10 years of life ahead of them. The criticism was also levelled at the trial have been about that there weren't very many younger patients with the median age of 67. Um, Can I ask a question here, George? Yeah. I mean, when you say that life expectancy is greater than 10 years predicted, that means the patient has a greater than 50% chance of being alive in 10 years. That's, that's yep. what this statement means, right? So you, you, you're, you're shifting your prediction of a bell curve to the right in selecting patients who you think will live longer than 10 years. So, yep. Yep. Your point. so you're not saying that 100% of them are going to live longer than 10 years. You're saying that on average, this population will live longer than 10 years. So that's what the statement means. 
Yeah, a fair point, I suppose. Yeah, um, that's yeah. The statistics, I think, certainly in reviews of this paper, have often talked about how the survival was poor in this group, and that the if they had been better at selecting even fitter patients, we may have seen better advantage. Um, true. Yeah, that's that's true. True selection. Yeah, and I suppose that then comes back to well, then are we when we talk about picking a prostate possible prostate cancer candidate, a treatment candidate, uh, should we be framing the conversation not to give a fifty percent chance of being alive in ten years, but it, should it be even higher then that we think it's seventy five? If this paper along that line of thought struggled to show an advantage, but yeah, um, moving along. So yeah, what what do the local guidelines or and international guidelines have on the topic in terms of relevant to this subject of age. Um, the Canadian guidelines are very similar to many of the other uh, worldwide guidelines in terms of PSA testing recommended for men up to an age of 70, picking a chronological number, but allowing scope, the, the, uh, reframing back that you shouldn't be doing it for men who are expected a, a life expectancy less than 10 years. And they expand in one of their statements that for those men who are over that chronological age of 70, that PSA can be considered uh, while there's not a great level of data for men who have a good life expectancy. Looking broader, further guideline blocks, I think the NCC and guidelines were interesting to read through because they really emphasise the role of life expectancy estimation in deciding whether early diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer was appropriate. They have um, helpfully provided some tools to assess life expectancy as a clinician uh, some of them this uh, detailed here in um, th this text really were just uh, actuarial population-based life expectancies, um, like I presented earlier on those you know, Canada-wide life expectancy. And I think you need to be careful that we're not just saying you're 85, what is an 80, or you know, you're 75, what does a 75-year-old in Canada live to? Should be more tailored to the patient's individual health status, their genetics, et cetera. And there are some more advanced tools like this MSKCC tool uh, that bring a bit more nuance to the conversation. This is a useful tool, and I've shown a screen grab here where you enter patient age. There are some of the uh, common potential comorbidities around cardiovascular, respiratory disease, et cetera, uh, but even details of their laced cholesterol, blood pressure, et cetera. And what I liked is that they were able... and for this situation, I've presented an 80-year-old who I made as fit as I could in terms of all their lab work, no comorbidities, and then they have a intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer. And it nicely presents in a pictorial format to be able to talk to a patient, 100 men, uh, where at 10 years we see the black, the, the little figurines in black are the patients that would be expected to be alive based on those data inputs. The yellow are those who would die with untreated prostate if untreated for prostate cancer, and the red are who would be dead from other causes. And I think these sorts of tools, I certainly haven't used MSKCC, but at home have used frequently this next tool that comes out of Cambridge University in the UK um, called the PREDICT prostate tool. Um, and it's based on observational data from thousands of men who have had non metastatic prostate cancer base from the UK. So always think where your data's come from. Is it applicable to my uh, setting? Um, and it provides the average survival for men uh, based on similar age and similar comorbidity characteristics. I've found it useful. Uh, you enter uh, patient details, but also uh, prostate cancer details into the algorithm. It takes a bit of time to get around it, but it can be useful to show to patients what for an average man in his situation with those particular features, what his prognosis is in life, what his prognosis is from prostate cancer and the inputs or not of treatment. So here, the dotted yellow line is the expected survival if you didn't have prostate cancer. Um, in the non-treated prostate cancer, the blue bar is at 10 years and then 15 years, those would be alive, when expected to be alive. You can then flick into a... a treatment tab and see, well, what changes if we treat you? Um, again, yellow line, survive, dotted line, survive. If you hadn't been treated, if you hadn't had prostate cancer, the thick blue bar is those um, alive if there'd been no treatment of prostate cancer. And then different degrees of computed benefit if you were treated. And 
think often for patients, it's a nice visual representation to say, look, this is your risk just from your comorbidity and your age and, um, and show them how that cha has changed. And then actually relative to that, the small or sometimes large benefit of treatment for their prostate cancer. As an insight, it also shows differences in functional outcomes and those can change by age as well. Um, last guideline group I sort of went to is the EAU guidelines that we use a lot for the New Zealand practice. And I think the interesting thing I've found since last looking at them that there's a lot of significant additional detail now around life expectancy estimation and the role of a geriatric evaluation for patients of higher chronological age with prostate cancer. They made some nice statements and you know, a lot of them are broad brush, but emphasizing that evaluation of life expectancy and health status is important. Um, that prostate cancer is common in older men uh, and diagnosis in those over 65 is expected to increase by 70% um, annual diagnosis rate by 2030 in Europe and the US. Uh, and that active treatment mostly benefits those uh, with intermediate and higher risk in the younger age. But there are trials, and they alluded to SPCG4, that show reduction in metastases in those over 65. Um, They've gone on to comment, which you know, challenged perhaps my New Zealand practice, if I'll call that, is that older men, while having a higher incidence of prostate cancer, uh, may be undertreated despite the high overall mortality rates um, in prostate. Because of all prostate cancer-related deaths, 71% occur in men over the age of 75. Um, and to frame really the low number of men in that age group being treated. They've pushed uh, the EAU guideline panel a an assessment tool called the Geriatric 8 tool. Um, and this is a simple screening questionnaire tool with eight questions. Um, you get a score between zero and 17, and the higher the score indicates a better health status. So I think for that older patient in front of you, can you give a bit more of a tailored nuance to uh, their life expectancy? An interesting thing I also saw in their guidelines, which has it data beside it and can be used in your office is something uh, called the gait speed estimation. Patient walks six metres and you average their per metre pace and there's good well, there's reasonable data that shows that if you do that at these certain age groups you can see what their life expectancy is from here. So I know I had a, a staff or a consultant at home who would get the man in his early 70s or mid 70s considering prostate cancer treatment to get himself up from a chair, walk to the wall and turn around and come back. The idea that if he could get up with no hands, he was a lot more robust than the guy who needed a couple of minutes to push himself up off the chair, hold the wall, and get himself up over to the wall and back. Um, and lastly, on the prostate cancer um, side of the, the, the geriatric oncology story, that the AUs and their guidelines now is linked to uh, this organisation, the Society, International Society of Geriatric Oncology, um, and a document that they have produced on prostate cancer management in older patients. Um, some highlight points I've listed there, but I think the big take home is that the recommendation is to treat prostate cancers on health status and certainly not to use chronological. We'll pause the prostate cancer tour. There's a, a shot from New Zealand and the South Island. If ever, anyone wants to come COVID permitting to my part of the world, I'd love to show you around. It's a beautiful place. Um, the next organ site I wanted to talk through in the geriatric population um, was the bladder and looking at muscle invasive disease. I thought this would be a less complicated conversation than the prostate uh, topic because it's been a much more lethal disease. We know there's a median survival of untreated muscle invasive bladder cancer of around 12 months. Um, and here I thought, you know, we, we would be much more talking about frailty evaluation than chronological, any relevance of chronological age. So I identified some papers around the older population and bladder cancer treatment. Um, there's a number of retrospective case series reviews uh, and showed that in patients when you've uh, controlled for comorbidity, elderly patients who underwent cystectomy um, had similar mortality uh, and complication rates to younger patients. From this paper, message that the carefully selected older patient can safely be offered an orthotopic urinary diversion as well, 
and that chronological age per se is not the contraindication to radical cystectomy in this uh, lethal disease. What about what type of treatment should we offer uh, for patients, older patients or those over 80 with muscle invasive bladder cancer? Uh, again, limited by a retrospective review, uh, but this paper comparing bladder preserving treatment with uh, radiation, chemo, and TURBT versus surgery, um, a SEER database review found a significantly lower overall survival trimodality therapy compared to surgery, as well as increased costs. If the retrospective, if there's a selection bias, it may be that the, the less fit older patient got the trimodal therapy. Um, and certainly there was data showing that this patient group tended to get a suboptimal, almost palliative radiation course than what would be typically thrown. Where are we at with the guidelines? The EAU muscle invasive bladder cancer guidelines, again, stress the importance of evaluation of comorbidity, frailty and cognition, and that these evaluations are much uh, better predictor of life expectancy in muscle invasive bladder cancer than just patient age. They clarify that certainly younger patients seem to benefit most from radical surgery and older patients would have a slightly higher or have a, do have a higher mortality. Um, and we see in one of their statements, uh, four versus 2% for 80 or over 80s versus over 70s. But there still is a benefit for older patients. Um, moving along, the time and the final organ I've looked at is really kidney and specifically renal cell carcinoma. And within this topic, I just wanted to look at small renal masses in the older population. There's several retrospective series reporting on the early surgical treatment of localised RCC in older patient cohorts um, and suggesting that there's perhaps not a significant survival benefit in the face of the high background risk of non-cancer death in our older populations, but also then the subsequent renal dysfunction and cardiovascular risk associated with surgery and nephron loss in the older population. Two papers uh, looking at here, uh, first uh, uh, patient, 2010 patient was a retrospective cohort study, so it has its limitations again. It looked at patients who were 75 years or eight, older who had their uh, sub seven centimetre mass uh, removed with surgery uh, and found that the patients mostly died of cardiovascular causes in the ensuing period, and this was similar to the general elderly population, um, and questioned the role for surgical intervention in those over 75. Uh, and the patient from Hollingsworth here uh, was in a SEER database review that showed after five years, nearly one third of these elderly patients have died by five years from other causes. So in face of studies like this that I just presented, um, there's increasing use and growing evidence base to show that we can safely manage these early uh, kidney tumours or lesions with active surveillance, much like we've uh, emerged with prostate cancer. Um, looking at some of the papers in older patients for around solid uh, small renal masses, uh, the trial which I've sort of used to talk to patients about at the time is the uh, delayed intervention and surveillance of small renal masses, the DISSRM trial. Um, it's a non-randomised, uh, important, uh, multi-institution trial uh, with a, enrolled about 500 patients with masses less than four centimetres. Um, and who undergo either active surveillance or primary intervention. So you need the patients who are in this non-randomised trial are going down active surveillance or older, the median age of uh, 70. Um, Follow-up is anywhere from a, a year through to nearly a decade. But importantly, it's found at five years, the cancer-specific survival was 99% and 100% respectively whether they had active surveillance or intervention, showing that certainly in the short to medium term, in our older patients, it's very safe to manage these without intervention. Uh, in terms of then, well, the cystic lesions, there's a slightly different category of the renal masses. Uh, trials presented uh, here and here show that for complex cystic lesions, there's recognition that there's a relatively indolent nature and that these may have even better prognosis than the solid renal masses, and certainly the active surveillance is safe. Uh, and this uh, paper here uh, from uh, Chandris Sika uh, showed that cancer survival and overall survival in patients with Bosnia um, uh, 
2F to Bosnia forced this is, uh, is very good in a medium follow-up of over five years, 300 patients, there was only one cancer-specific death. And the systematic review published in the J-Year-Old uh, pointed out that the number needed to treat to prevent metastatic spread may be as high as 140, so 140 nephrectomies for a Bosniak 3 cis and 40 for Bosniak 4 cis. So uh, racing through those, but I think the take home is that we now have data that the nat natural history of sub-7 centimetre renal masses is largely indolent uh, and active surveillance. So if it's active, it's not just send them out to pasture. Active surveillance is safe in the medium term. Um, and while there are data sets that capture some of our older patients, particularly those over 75, the data is limited for those you know, entering out at the patients into the early and mid-80s. So really, after the, presenting those three organ systems to summarise um, and Leave then ultimately open for some discussion. Uh, we're living in a society where the number of elderly is increasing, and our elderly are also living longer and with better health. So, with this, becomes a greater volume of patients arriving at our urology oncology door who will be diagnosed with urological malignancies. Much of the research base that we use to guide our treatment of our urological malignancies and our day-to-day -day practice for all patients tends to exclude patients in their late 70s and beyond. And so we're left to extrapolate data to older patient groups and often like the prostate cancer data sets to extrapolate that 10-year life expectancy and use that same figure in all the same concept in a patient, older patient cohort. Um, and we base these decisions on the life expectancy, but also the important in frailty. I think my reading of the guidelines and the papers that I've presented today is while chronological age is a risk factor for frailty and comorbidity, it shouldn't be used in isolation to be making treatment decisions. And I think the NCCN provided some nice sort of summary guidelines and more detailed text if you want to look at it, um, really showing you know, that we shouldn't be just using age um, and that we need to do more tailored medicine to look at and use tools to better characterise the patient's risk from their comorbidity and frailty, their uh, mobility, functional status and nutrition, and that this estimation of life expectancy is essential. And with this, so there are tools available to help us because clinicians and certainly patients' uh, estimates of life expectancy can be wildly inaccurate and are influenced by more than just our own clinical education and clinical experience. And I think what I want people listening to this talk is pause and think, well, what are my biases and what do I bring to that thought process when I think about the patient in front of me? And I've presented some of the validated tools that exist to hopefully remove some of this bias and help us better characterise our patient's risk. I'd just like to say thank you for listening early on a Wednesday morning and thanks again for the hospitality here in Vancouver.